Clay said, man, Mr. Vic, why would you give me ten verses the first time I have to read Scripture? I said, any man who took his first Lord's Supper in Honduras needs to read a chapter or two. <laughs> ah, he did a great job, though. We appreciate that very, very much. We're glad that all of you are here. We're very grateful for all of our visitors being here this morning. And uh, we hope that the fish fry was good and you enjoyed yourselves there. And if you didn't, I hope you enjoyed your family a little bit. Uh, and hope you'll come back any opportunity that you might have. There are probably numerous passages in the New Testament that we could read that summarize the Christian life. I got to thinking about that and two or three came to my mind. One of them was Romans 14 verse 8. For there the Apostle Paul says, For whether we live, we live unto Christ. Or whether we die... We die unto Christ. Whether we live therefore or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Another very familiar passage is Galatians 2 verse 20. Paul says, For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Again, Paul writes in Philippians 1, verse 21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If we were to summarize living the Christian life, my friends, we could say that living in Christ and living for Christ is the very essence of what you and I are supposed to be doing every day of our lives. But it's more involved than just living for Christ. Yes, that's the summary. That's how we would describe it. But it involves some very intricate details. It involves some very specific things that God calls upon each one of us to do. There are many components, many elements that make up our Christian life. And we have been in a series of lessons entitled The Christian Life. This is the fifth of the series. And we're going to continue talking about some of the things that compose the life that you and I live as Christians. What kind of life is the Christian life? First, the Christian life is a life of thanksgiving. I looked up the definition of thanksgiving and there was a wonderful definition that was given that went like this. The celebration of all of the divine blessings, favors, and kindnesses of God. Note that word, a celebration of everything that you and I have received at God's hand. There are many, many verses in the Bible that exhort us to be people of thanksgiving. Enter into His gates with praise and into His courts with thanksgiving. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. Psalm 100 verse 4. We turn into the pages of the New Testament and over and over we are exhorted to be individuals who give thanks. Philippians 4 verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. Colossians 2 and seven again exhorts us to be people of great thanks before God rooted and built up in him and established in the faith abounding therein with thanksgiving just one chapter later in Colossians chapter 2 and verse or just a couple of chapters later in chapter 4 and verse 2 the apostle Paul again exhorts us to be people of thanksgiving pray without ceasing or continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Sometimes it is difficult to be people of thanksgiving, isn't it? If you and I are really going to show thanksgiving unto God, there are at least 
three elements that must come together, that must interlock in order for us to celebrate the things that God has given unto us. Number one, there must be a recognition of the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. Sometimes, you and I are not always cognizant of God's blessings. And there might be several reasons for that. In fact, we could probably preach an entire lesson why you and I don't recognize the blessings of the Almighty God. One reason is because sometimes those blessings come cloaked in difficulties and hardships. How many of us have ever dropped to our knees and given thanks unto God for our suffering? And yet James says, Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. James chapter 1, verse 2. How many of us have really gone into our closets and offered up a celebration of thanks unto God because we were persecuted and mocked and ridiculed because we are a child of the living God. And yet Jesus says to rejoice in our persecutions and be exceeding glad for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Matthew chapter 5 verse 12. You see, sometimes the blessings of God are cloaked in sufferings and hardships and difficulties. And when they come upon us in that fashion, we are not always individuals of thanksgiving. Another reason that we don't give thanks is because sometimes we become far too comfortable with the blessings that God gives us, especially those blessings that are given on a regular daily basis in our lives. Though somehow, in order for us to be individuals who live lives of thanks, we have to open up our eyes and we have to recognize the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. Point number two, in order for us to really give thanks, not only do we have to recognize the blessing, but we also have to rejoice in that blessing, don't we? Just a moment ago was read in our hearing a very familiar miracle of our Lord Jesus Christ. He entered into a town and there met him ten men that the Bible says were lepers. Folks, most of us know a little bit about leprosy. If you don't, go home and study it for a while. Leprosy was an extremely devastating disease. In fact, so devastating that sometimes parts of your body your fingers, your toes, your nose, your ears would literally fall off. You were in a constant state of pain. You were separated from the entirety of the nation of Israel. You were forced to acknowledge your presence before all individuals. I am a leper. I am a leper. Unclean. Unclean. And you knew that death was the only, the only end of this horrible disease. Now Jesus enters into this town and those ten men, the Bible says, meet Him. And they cried out unto Him, Lord, have mercy upon us. And Jesus responds to their need, doesn't He? Go, show thyself unto the priest. And the text says this, And as they went, they were cleansed. Let me ask you something. Do you think those individuals recognized that they were cleansed of their leprosy? I bet all ten of them recognized it, don't you? Look at our flesh. It's completely whole. My body no longer aches. There's no longer the pain that is associated with this leprosy anymore. Folks, they easily recognized that they had been cleansed of their disease. But the Bible says, and one of them, when he saw that he was cleansed, turned back and gave glory unto God and fell down at his feet, listen to this, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. 
Here was a man who not only recognized the blessing that he received, but he also rejoiced in that blessing. Can you imagine what he must have felt like? Wow! Unbelievable! I'm healed! No more separation. No more imminent death. No more pain. And he runs back to Jesus, glorifying God for the miracle that had transpired on his behalf. A man rejoicing because of his blessings. But nine of them didn't rejoice, did they? Is it easy for us sometimes not to rejoice in the blessings that we have? Kathleen and I, during the course of our preaching, have purchased two or three homes, and there's good and bad in buying homes as far as a preacher is concerned. But folks, sometimes I just like to sit in my living room. Got a little gas fireplace there. And I just think, you know, what a blessing it is to have a house that you can call your own. What a blessing. I'm standing up here before you in a Joseph A. Banks suit. Traveler's shirt. A silk tie. Folks, I ought to give thanks unto God that I'm able to wear this. Go to Honduras. You'll be thankful for the clothes you've got. Almost everybody got up this morning and probably had something for breakfast. And after we get through, we'll probably go either home or to a restaurant and we'll eat and our bellies will be full all day long. We'll not have to want for anything to eat. We drove here in beautiful cars. Some of them almost brand new. Most of us have good families, good moms and good dads who love us, care about us, provide for us, want what's the best for us, and do anything they possibly could to take care of our needs. We have a wonderful congregation of the Lord's people that meets here at Eastwood. Individuals who love the Lord Jesus Christ, who are striving to their utmost to be obedient unto Him. A congregation who is living and active, and who is willing to give when they are asked to give and will do so beyond measure. We ought to be thankful for a congregation like that. We have jobs that we can go to. We have plenty of money, not only to provide us with the necessities of life, but also luxuries of life. You see, we've been given all of these things, but my question is this, do we really, really, really rejoice like that? Samaritan leper who was cleansed of leprosy. Lastly, you and I have to regard our responsibility of giving thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. What is the will of God? Folks, it's found in the first part of the verse. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If you and I are going to live lives of thanksgiving, those three things must come together. Recognize the blessing. Rejoice in the blessing. And then regard our responsibility to bow before the throne of God and give thanks for all that we have. And it will manifest itself in more than one way. Oh yes, there's the thanksgiving of the mouth. Offering up praise unto the Almighty God for all the things that He's given. But there's also what some refer to as thank living. Look at all that I've got. How in the world could I deny my Lord? How in the world could I not live for Him when I really look at everything He's done for me in my life? Thanks living before God. And then there's also another one called thanks dash giving. 
based upon all the things that I have been provided for by God the Father, I will open up my storehouses and I will render back unto Him as much as I possibly can. I will not be selfish. I will not try to hold on to it. I will pour out the abundance of what I have because of the abundance of what He has given me. Thanks, giving before God. Yes, as Christians, we live lives of thanksgiving. Point number two. As Christians, you and I live a life of freedom. Over and over the Bible talks about freedom or liberty that you and I possess. Jesus made a promise of it, did He not? In John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Four verses later, in verse 36, Jesus says this, For if the Son of Man shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Galatians 5 verse 13, For ye have been called unto liberty, the Bible says. In that same chapter in verse 1, what I believe to be the key verse of the book of Galatians, Paul says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. My friends, if there is anything anybody longs for, it is freedom, is it not? Individuals get themselves under a very tyrannical taskmaster, and the one thing they desire is to be let free. Right now, we are beginning to experience in the United States of America an oppression placed upon us as citizens that, my friends, we do not need at this particular time. Our freedoms are being embarked upon, and one of these days we're going to wake up slaves to our government, and we're going to be begging again for freedom. I've only known two or three men who are literally prisoners of war. And they will tell you that every day when they were in those prison camps, when they were in those prison cells, they literally prayed for their freedom every day of their lives. You go to the jails and you study with those individuals and you talk to those individuals in prison and they will tell you this, let's sing a song. What do you want to sing? I'll fly away. Why? Folks, they want out of prison. Freedoms are gone, aren't they? I can go talk to a few teenagers. And all they want is a little freedom, isn't it? I can't wait to get out of this old house and do whatever I want to. The minute I turn 18, Mom and Dad, I'll be what? I'll be free, they think. Almost everybody I talk to desires financial freedom, do they not? Wouldn't it be nice never have to worry about whether you can pay a bill or not? Wouldn't it be nice anytime you desire to go out and buy something, you almost don't even have to think about it, you just go out and just buy it because you know that you've got what you need? Wouldn't it be wonderful to be about 45 or 50 years old and just go into work one day and say, Hey guys, I'm done with you. It's over. And you know you can live to be 150 and never work again. Financial freedom. You see, freedom is something that all individuals long for. And yet, today we find many individuals, spiritually, who are in the depths of slavery and confinement and bondage, don't we? Oh, there's numerous illustrations about which we could speak. In the first century, there were individuals who were doing all they could to enslave those new Christians to the bondage of the law of Moses. Folks, that was a difficult, rigorous, hard, intense, intricate law to obey, was it not? And it was a law that once it was violated, there was no forgiveness found in that system. It is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin, Hebrews 10, 3 and 4. That's why the Apostle Paul told that church 
or the churches of Galatia, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. The law of Moses was a law of bondage. We go out into our world and we find many individuals who are still in the bondage of sin and iniquity, don't we? Folks, some of the best illustrations that you could find upon the planet or go and look at individuals who are bound to addictions. Individuals who know that they no longer have their freedom. Their addiction now enslaves them. They don't control themselves. They don't control their feelings. They don't control their actions. Oftentimes, it is the addiction that is controlling everything that they do and almost every thought that they think. The bondage of sin. There's the bondage of man-made religion, isn't there? You see, man for some reason believes that he knows more than God knows. And man has written their creed books and they have published those creed books and individuals adhere to those creed books and individuals are in bondage to those books rather than being free through the precious Word of the living God. Almost every human being upon the face of the earth is in bondage to death, is he not? Individuals don't like to think about it. Individuals don't like to be near it. And yet every one of us is cognizant of the fact that one of these days we are going to die. That's 100% certainty, isn't it? How many individuals are bound to worry and anxiety and fretting and those feelings of deep despair because of problems and difficulties that they face in life? And my friends, there is that tyrannical master that owns many individuals in our world known as Satan himself. What's interesting is this. You and I as God's children, should be enslaved to none of those things. You and I are not enslaved to the law of Moses. Paul writes in Romans 7 verse 6, But now are ye delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein you're held. We're delivered from the law, folks. That law is no longer a law that binds us. You and I have been freed from sin, have we not? But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. As members of the Lord's church, you and I are not bound by human creeds and disciplines and manuals. You and I live under what is known as the perfect law of liberty. James 1, verse 25. And the Bible says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, verse 2. This is a law of freedom. You and I do not any longer have to fear worry, do we? Or fear, fear death anymore. I don't know about you, death doesn't concern me. Oh yes, I know one day I will die. And yes, sometimes I stop and I think that how am I going to go through that process? Is it going to be sudden? Is it going to be by disease? Is it going to be a long, drawn out thing? Yes, we think about those things, but death itself no longer concerns me. Why? Because my Savior's conquered the grave, friends. Hebrews chapter 2. 14 and 15. And He's delivered us from the bondage of death. What about worry and anxiety? We quoted the passage a while ago. Be careful for nothing. Don't be anxious. Don't be troubled. Don't be worried about anything. But by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now watch this. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
If you and I are truly the Christians that we ought to be, we pour out our prayers unto God the Father. We dump every one of our concerns, all of our troubles, all of our anxieties at the throne of God, and we say, God, you take care of those. And we arise without a fret or a worry in the world anymore. And my friends, there's not a one of us, if we're Christians, who have not been set free from the bondage of Satan. You and I answer the call of our Lord Jesus Christ to come and to be bound with Him, to be yoked with Him. And now He is our Master and now He pulls the burden of our loads together with Him. Now isn't that a paradox? We've been talking about what? Being free, haven't we? We've been talking about not being in bondage not being in slavery. And yet, the Bible teaches that every one of us are slaves of Jesus Christ. But my friends, here's our motto. Slaves of Christ, yet free. Yes, free indeed. A child of God lives a life of freedom today. Point number three. My friends, a Christian life is a life of great, and I want you to underline that, highlight it, draw a circle around it, whatever you've got to do, capitalize it. The Christian life is a life of great abundance. Jesus said in John 10, in verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Two words or phrases we need to focus on. Number one, life. In the Greek language, it's the word zoe. Z-O-E. If you look it up in Strong's, he says that it means this. Life. I hate that. So that's why I recommend Thayer's at times too. Because here's what Thayer says. The state of one possessed of vitality or is animate. Of absolute fullness of life. Life real and genuine. A life active and vigorous. Devoted to God. Blessed. Jesus says that I am come to give you life. A genuine life. A real life. A life is animated, a life that is full, a life that is blessed, a life that is devoted to the Almighty God. And notice that He didn't stop there. He says, I am come so that you will have life more abundantly. I'm glad they translated it more abundantly. Because the word means this, super abundance. Super abundance. What Jesus says is this, I have come and I have put life in your basket. And I have filled that basket to the brim. And not only have I filled it to the brim, but I have overflowed it beyond measure for you. And yet, many of my brethren say, Vic, what are you talking about? I don't have an abundant life in Christ Jesus. It's dull, it's dry, it's boring. I just go through the motions. Wish I didn't even have to. Really. Folks, I've been thinking about this for a long time. Because that's what I see a lot of times. And it concerns me. And I sincerely believe that the reason we're having that difficulty in the body of Christ today is because individuals have not studied and they do not understand the Christian life. They are viewing it out of human perspective rather than viewing it through divine eyes. And folks, let me tell you something. Living it through divine eyes is radically different than trying to live it through human eyes. Did you know that? 
radically different. Let's read two or three statements from the Word of God to show you how radically different the Christian life is from the one that maybe even we sometimes desire. Luke 9, 23. Jesus is speaking. If any man come after me, let him take up his cross and deny himself daily and follow after me. See, folks, we don't live in a society that practices self-denial. Oh, no. It's what I want, what I desire. I got to have the things that I want. I got to have the things that if I, I desire. And if I don't have the things that I want and desire, guess what? Then I'm just not happy. In fact, I'll sit over here and pout. In fact, I'll sit over here and just pitch a fit about it until I get it. And we wonder why we're miserable. Jesus says the Christian life's about self-denial, folks. Far too many of us want and want and want and want and want and want. And yet Jesus says, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Luke 12, verse 15. We turn to Hebrews 11, verse 25. It talks about Moses. And the Bible says this, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season... What a nutcase, wasn't he? Who in their right mind would substitute suffering and affliction for the pleasures of sin? Those Moses could have had it all, could he not? He could have done whatever he desired. He could have lived however he wanted to live. And what did he do? He chose rather to suffer affliction and go read his life and watch those 40 years in the wilderness and how much agony that was placed upon him in those years and didn't even get to go over into the promised land. But he lived an abundant life. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, and men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Matthew 5, 8 through 10. Really? A person is blessed to be persecuted? A person is blessed to be mocked? A person is blessed to be hated by other individuals for Jesus Christ's sake? I've been there. I've done that. It's not all that fun, is it? That man is blessed, Jesus says. You drop down just a few verses further in Matthew chapter 5, and Jesus makes this statement. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love thine enemy. Wow. There's something that goes against the grain, doesn't it? Folks, you pick up the Word of God and you read it. And the Word of God and its teachings run contrary to what our culture and what mankind has to think in many respects. And I haven't but touched the hem of the garment on various things. Control your mouth. Control your tongue. Be individuals who love to serve. Be individuals who reach deep into their pockets and are willing to give unto other individuals. On and on the list goes. And everything that we talk about runs so contrary to the way our society strives to practice a life of happiness and abundance. If you and I want an abundant life, if we want a thrill-packed, vital, intimate Christian life. We're going to have to see that life through divine glasses instead of human glasses. And when we do, we'll find it is the richest life that an individual could possibly live. The tide's beginning to turn on our lessons just a little bit. 
starting to talk about some positive things, aren't we? Folks, our life should be a life of thanksgiving. It is a life of freedom. And Jesus says that it should be an abundant life. And yet sometimes what God desires for our life to be is completely different from what our lives really are, isn't it? I find that interesting because I can't create myself. The reality is I know very little about myself. I have no clue how many hairs I have on my head. Do you? Maybe there might be a couple in here. Because they ain't got none. But most of us have no clue. Folks, when you and I get sick, we can't heal ourselves, can we? There's absolutely no way that any one of us can save ourselves from sin. If you and I had to depend on ourselves to save ourselves from de death, we could not do it. And yet, somehow, some way, we think that we know what is best for us instead of what God wants for us. Really. God created us. God knows all there is about us. God can heal us. God can save us from our sins. And my friends, one day, God will resurrect every dead person from the graves and they will all stand up again. That God knows what's best for my life. Have you yielded to what He desires of you? Maybe you're not a Christian and you need to be this morning. The steps are simple, aren't they? Hear the precious gospel of Jesus Christ, Luke 8, verse 15. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, John 8, 24. Be willing to repent of sins, that is, die to that old way of living, Acts 17, 30 and 31. Make the good confession, Romans 10, 9 and 10. That is, the confession that He is the Christ, the Son of God. And then, come forward and let us baptize you, immerse you in water, for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 22, verse 16. Dear Christian, what about you? Can you honestly say your life is a full and abundant life? One that's animated, one that's joyous, one that superabounds with the blessings of God? Maybe there's something in your life that's enslaving you. Maybe it's sin. And you need to ask God to forgive you. If you need to respond to this invitation, won't you come as we stand and sing?